Good morning. Um, appreciate you joining uh, uh, joining us this morning. Um, I wanted to uh, invite everyone to a uh, uh, to this uh, webinar um, uh, for pest management professionals. Uh, this uh, program has been uh, brought to you by a, uh, a, a funding that was provided through the EPA Region Five Center uh, and uh, transferred through to the uh, to uh, to the Minnesota Department of Ent uh, sorry Minnesota Department of Agriculture. The program that we're working on is a regional bed bug working group or a resource group for the uh, for for Region Five, and uh, some of the information that I'm going to be sharing with you are findings from some of that effort that we've been uh, we've been working on. My name is Stephen Kells. I'm an associate professor at the uh, University of Minnesota Department of Entomology. I also have with me uh, Amelia Schindelar, who is our community health coordinator and uh, works as with the uh, with bed bug um, uh, let's beat the bug uh, uh, group coordinating that uh, that uh, that effort so the uh, so the information that we're going to pass on to you today is is uh, as, um, essentially focuses on uh, the pest management professional pest management industry and uh, things that we we're seeing um, uh, and some some things that we're getting or receiving through feedback from uh, from uh, the general public, and uh, we receive a lot of uh, a lot of information from from a variety of sources. So we're collecting quite a bit of information, and and uh, just to let you know, um, some of this information is is coming from our direct uh, work in the field, in the uh, working in apartments or working in houses. Um, or being called out to look at problem areas, and uh, so we learn quite a bit uh, by uh, through doing that. Uh, the picture that you see is actually some work that we did earlier on when we were testing the limitations of uh, heating uh, heating units, heating devices. We're also receiving uh, information and considerable information, as you'll see, uh, through our Let's Beat the Bug website. Uh, that's bedbugs.umn.edu. Uh, we'll have the uh, we'll have the information uh, later on of, um, our, our, for for how to contact us. Um, but we are um, evaluating the uh, the information as we as we as we go along. Of course, in lab we do um, research and uh, and we we've, we've looked at a number of different uh, things for bed bug behavior, response to insecticides. And uh, response to different chemicals, um, as well as some efficacy work. Um, and so we're we're collecting data as well. And then we're also taking information from um, other research, uh, researchers and uh, incorporating this uh, information, which is often critical um, to to uh, uh, to doing um, uh, to doing successful pest management. So we we look at various groups from uh, Purdue, from Susan Jones at the Ohio State University. Uh, through uh, uh, Chang Lu Wong at Rutgers, Deanie Miller at Virginia Tech, Bill Kaler, um, and a variety of other people in, in uh, Texas, Auburn, and uh, California. And I'm sorry if I've missed anyone out, but um, essentially we are, we are, long story short, we are collecting a lot of information and learning a lot about this insect, uh, not only through our efforts, but through the valuable efforts of others. So the goal for today's uh, uh, talk is to discuss the issues that are being encountered with bed bugs, and then uh, as a pest management professional, how can you avoid control failures, and how can you better uh, provide services to your customers so that um, so that the uh, they're of greater value to the uh, to the uh, to your customer. Now, one thing I'm not going to uh, talk about are the I'm not going to get into a lot of detail. With the uh, uh, with the um, with the different types of, uh, of of heating equipment or, or control equipment, uh, but we I will um, sort of incorporate some of that information as we go along. Um, you know, we do have heating, we do have uh, insecticides, and we we talked about how and where to place these uh, materials and uh, what sort of uh, what sort of performances are required. So I'm not going to sort of 
rehash this, this information. Um, it's available in a number of different uh, other webinars as well as uh, available with, uh, in writings from, from a variety of extension uh, centers. So um, I just let you know I won't be I won't be directly uh, discussing any of that. However, if you do have questions, we'll, we'll see if we can uh, take some of them up at the end of this uh, uh, presentation. I would put forward to you that um, actually we've pretty well figured out how to kill bed bugs when it comes to um, when it comes to the uh, to the uh, uh, to um, how bed bugs are killed within a, an area, say, that has a, a bedroom that, that has a bed and furniture and that sort of thing, we can successfully kill bed bugs in, the, in those areas. But the, um, the challenge is often, you know, can we make it to control results faster? Can we make them cheaper? Can we make them easier? Can we make them safer? Um, these are all things, and the safer not only from uh, if you're considering insecticide applications, making sure that you're using registered products, but also, but also um, from the point of view of um, of uh, heating of, of uh, materials. Now, a lot of this type of faster, cheaper, easier, safer is going to actually come from um, looking at into research onto uh, biology of uh, into biology of bed bugs and 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 how and how to deliver this in a different way. So it's it's going to be a uh, uh, it's going to definitely need more research, but um, as it stands right now, it, it can be a can be a costly item, but we can progressively get rid of bed bugs um, within a certainly within a single family house. Um, it's usually it's usually a one time or a couple of control events and we're done. Um, and then with the multifamily housing, it can certainly work. Um, it just needs to be done progressively, and that's what I'd really like to, uh, to talk about. So the question that you might be asking yourself, so if you're so confident about control solutions, why do we still have problems with bed bugs? Well, there's a, I think the answer comes down to uh, this idea that, um, yes, the control uh, technology that we have works, but how we use it, when we use it, and where we use these controls uh, will often, um, and, or how we misuse them, or how we don't use them completely, um, it's, it's these things that uh, result in bed bugs surviving to bite another day. So within an identifiable control area, if, if controls are used thoroughly, certainly they're dead. But the big problem that we're often seeing time and time again are that uh, the, the actual the source of bed bugs are outside that immediate control area, and those bed bug sources are ready to uh, reinfest and move back into areas. So again, when we look at these uh, types of different control um, um, technologies, they are effective, um, but how can we use them better? How can we start um, trying to figure out how to incorporate them into a, into a larger type of practice or program so that we uh, so that we get uh, we get adequate control and, and progressive control, and we're not just simply um, having pest control uh, personnel go in on a monthly basis and, and do a, sort of a small spray area, um, and yet have them survive. So we've come up with five tips for effectively dealing with infestations, and I wanted to cover those tips because these are these are um, uh, these are the uh, practices. That we often see that are that are missing or that are shorted during a uh, during a, a pest management uh, pract um, uh, practice um, that would then um, that would then allow bed bugs to survive. So, um, and I've summarized them in, in in five five tips. I would say with the first with the first tip. You should really make sure that uh, you are looking for eradication from a living space and prevention of bed bugs from, uh, uh, from future reoccurrence. Now, th this is really important because if you, when you, when you're, when you're looking at uh, control of bed bugs, um, we really need to. If you have bed bugs within an area, it should be a complete eradication from that living space. 
And then, and then in terms of prevention, what are you going to do about follow-up? How are you going to instruct the, uh, the tenants living there to prevent them from carrying bed bugs back into their, uh, their, their, their apartment or their house? And this kind of redefines pest management, um, in, in that normally we think about pest management in terms of the, the sanitation, the monitoring, and the, uh, um, and the, uh, exclusion, and a variety of other steps. Um, as well as as well as the control steps that, and the chemistry that we would use, it kind of redefines that pest management rather than as as a, as a series of, of unique steps the, that I've just mentioned. Uh, we look at pest management as as a series of eradication and prevention steps. So if you find it in a in a location, you're going your goal should be to eradicate that uh, that infestation and then prevent and uh, prevent the infestation from coming back and then. The next step, if, you, if, it, if it happens again, then there should be a eradication step and then a prevention step. And really, the important thing behind this is that the pest control um, activities should be sold in this manner. And, and quite often, um, I've, I, I've found in cases, particularly where we have chronic infestation, it's not really being sold in that manner. It's it's uh, it's being sold on, well, we'll come in, we'll spray, um, and we'll, we'll do our best to control it, but that's, that's, that's the extent. And it could be the landlord, it could be, uh, tenants that are, that are causing, uh, causing difficulties. But, uh, if we start approaching it from the point of view of, yes, we have to eradicate from this site, and then we have to prevent, and then take those steps repeatedly going forward, um, it, we should be able to, uh, uh, drastically reduce the, uh, the infestation in, in areas. Please remember that bed bugs are not cockroaches. Uh, we know from, um, uh, through, through cockroach behavior biology, um, we can really localize the applications of insecticides, uh, to, uh, to control bed, uh, to control cockroaches quite well. We can use, we don't necessarily have to use sprays, we can use, uh, baits. Um, we can use IGRs to uh, to control uh, um, cockroaches, and and so our our control efforts um, and how we sell the, those efforts are completely different from bed bugs. If you're thinking about bed bug control, uh, we should be looking at if you're using insecticides, we should be looking at three formulations of insecticides used to the fullest extent permitted by the label. So we should be using some combination of residual insecticide in cracks and crevices, contact insecticide where, where, it's, where it's allowed, um, and where people are going to be in extended contact with, uh, with, with um, fabric and with other materials, and then a dust for the wall voids and in behind the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the plugs and the, and the switches as well. And so we really need to start talking when, and this is, this is that step in eradication. This is, this is the, essentially providing, um, areas that are, that are going to be free of bed bugs, and if they're going to likely harbor in an area, then they're going to come into contact with an insecticide. Similarly, if you're delivering heat, um, in areas, um, uh, you need to deliver heat as extensively as possible throughout the living space, and make sure that you use insecticides in areas where you know you're not being able, you're not able to deliver the heat into that area. Um, walls can receive heat and the heat can penetrate, but uh, in some cases where we have large thermal masses, such as concrete walls in behind the, uh, the metal studs, we might not be able to deliver the heat into that as effectively. Um, outside temperatures might be colder than, uh, than allows for uh, heat to, to penetrate into the wall voids. So uh, using dust is, a, is critical for, um, uh, in those areas, is critical to, uh, to preventing bed bugs from harboring in those areas. So now that I've mentioned that, the, the, you know, you might be asking yourself, well, you know, we've constantly been hammered at this idea we, we, should, be, we should be selling integrated pest management and uh, pest management programs. And certainly that, that is, that is correct and that still stands. But like I said, the pest management program kind of becomes this plan or this series of the eradication and, and prevention steps. And so the pest management program uh, addresses the continued spread of infestation, 
uh, you know, you, you want to make sure that the tenants know their responsibilities and, and properly prepare for the control procedures. Um, and you, and it also, you want to start informing the landlords when you run into scenarios that it might be tough for tenants to comply with your instructions to, to that would otherwise allow you to have this eradication step or for that matter the prevention step. And, and, and for an example, Say you have a, uh, um, a tenant who is elderly, cannot manage the materials uh, uh, the, themselves. Um, you might have to bring in a social service uh, 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 place, or you may have to offer a service where you help them with their uh, with their, uh, their, their their cleaning needs, so that that allows you to do that proper uh, prevention step, our proper eradication step. In the prevention step. If we have someone that says, say, that is non-responsive to bed bugs, that might be the case where we, we employ, uh, climb up interceptor traps, um, to make sure that we've, we've completely gotten rid of those bed bugs out of those areas. Um, and so it's, it, it helps to, uh, direct the resources to where you need it the most. And so then the pest management program becomes a succession of eradication, prevention, eradication, prevention, and progressively you go through the building, and particularly multifamily housing, you go progressively go through the building um, with fewer and fewer reinfestations uh, occurring. So just to, just to reiterate this, because I think it's really important for, uh, for, for dealing with it. And, you know, we often talk about um, uh, this idea of inspecting uh, apartments um, uh, next to adjacent to areas as well as apartments uh, across the hallway and, and down the hall. And we've seen in a number of cases in Minnesota in, in some of the, um, the, uh, uh, the programs that are more successful in controlling, in, in, especially in low-income housing, where they're they're just not sort of following these these types of complaints where they might get a they might get a complaint and they do a control job and then they might do a complaint they might get another complaint and they do a control job and then they get another complaint and they do a control job and so on and so forth we're not getting that type of uh, that type of you know sort of chasing the problem around and then having the landlord become more and more frustrated because it doesn't seem like we're getting a handle on it or they, they suddenly become super bugs or they have this, this supernatural power when, in fact, they don't. It's just how they've been able to um, establish and spread within the building. So if we were to look at a proper program, if, say, we were to get a complaint, then by inspecting, by controlling that in that area and then inspecting the neighboring uh, apartments in that area, you can start to get an idea of what's happening within the building and uh, you can successfully uh, um, control, if necessary, those areas. So you, you get another complaint and again, you, you, you actually find that that first, just allow me to get a laser pointer here, that, that first complaint might have been a complaint on its own whereas the second complaint might have, might have been a systemic uh, spread uh, to other areas of the building. But by, by getting around the infestation, you're able to establish where the actual infestation is and the extent to which it is. It's just not apartment by apartment. It can be section by section or building by building. And by doing that, we can, we can get gain progressive control of, uh, of these areas. So I guess my summary for this uh, number one tip is, uh, you know, make sure that, um, you know, you're selling eradication and prevention uh, steps within each living space and make sure you sell the pest management program that uses that progressive eradication and prevention steps in all living spaces so that you prov progressively uh, reduce the, the bed bug impact in the building. Um, it might take some time, uh, depending on, we'll talk about some of the other things and the other tips that you have to realize as we go through. But, but by selling it first as that, then you're able to um, uh, get, uh, start to get ahead of the infestation and start to really make reductions in the infestation. And we see this in research. If we look at some of uh, uh, Dean Miller's work, if we look at some of Chang Lu Wang's work, um, when they go into to uh, provide a program that uh, uh, that starts to reduce an infestation, they're looking at this type of larger building extent of of uh, of, 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 um, of work.
Okay, my control no tip number two, and I think this is really important, make sure you are actually dealing with bed bugs. Um, you know, we get a lot of people that think they have bed bugs just because there's a, there's an arthropod or something that, um, um, that is on the, uh, uh, that is on the, or around their bed. Um, and, um, and then even, even then, uh, we have a lot of people who don't actually know what bed bugs look like. And I'm showing down in the bottom corner, uh, of the, of the, of the room here, or of the, of the, sc of the screen, uh, this is the, uh, Minnesota Department of Agriculture's bed bug room that we present at the, um, at the Minnesota State Fair every year. And, uh, we participate in this just to see how things are going and what people are asking in that. And we actually bring live bed bugs into the, into the fair and we, uh, we show them as people go by and, and some people like these, these people, um, are very interested in it and other people are just in some, in this case, I think these two people with on their uh, scooters decided to increase the velocity and go by the booth a little bit faster. So we, we get a lot of different people seeing the room and, and having different responses. But I think the biggest thing is when they see these live bed bugs crawling around, they just, they, they're just astounded at how big they actually are. And so we have a great number of people that don't actually know what bed bugs look like and, and, and what they are. They think they're this mythical, invisible pest that will, that will, will, that will, once they get them, they're going to have them, uh, uh for life. Um, to our bed bug, uh, information line, uh, we, um, we, uh, we, we, uh, offer an identification services and, uh, actually, for identifications that we've had for the past three and a half years, 76% of them are actually not bed bugs at all, and people had thought they were bed bugs. And here's just a, a random sampling of things that we, we will get on the, uh, on the um, coming in. Uh, we may get something like a beetle, um, either the adult or the uh, juvenile form. Uh, we may get a fly, a fruit fly that uh, someone had crushed and had a red smear, and so someone thought that that was blood, and uh, ended up uh, ended up being worried that it was bed bugs. Um, we may get uh, just completely different insects, such as uh, earwigs. In this case, um, uh, beetle larvae. The, we get a lot of domestic beetle larvae coming in, um, and people thinking that they're bed bug caskins. Um, we get dust bunnies or little bits of fluff that people are bringing in. And then we'll also get um, scab and nose nuggets and the other materials that uh, that actually um, look like bed bugs in some sort of shape but uh, but are actually not uh, not bed bugs whatsoever. And and you'll see that a lot of it is uh, becomes a becomes a um, becomes a, a, a major issue. So even if it is a bed bug, um, we can still we still need to know the species of it because we do get uh, we do get issues of uh, where we could get a human bed bug or a common bed bug like I have here on the left hand side that I'm circling right now, or we can get a bat bug or a swallow bug which I'm circling on the right right hand side, and I'll show you the difference between the two a little bit closer. But there's been a lot of embarrassed. Uh, um, pest management professionals who've gone out to control um, human bed bugs and uh, when a, and in fact they've had a bad bug issue and uh, and just continually having the, these callbacks because they're they're continually doing control for, for for common bed bugs or human bed bugs in the raw in areas when actually the bad bugs are in, diff in a different area altogether so we just have to be really cognizant. Of, uh, of making sure that we get the right species of, uh, of, of bed bug um, if we do in fact get bed bugs. So my summary for this is uh, really we need to we need to make sure that you have are properly equipped. You should have a, uh, a something like a geology loop or if you have a if you have a, a low power microscope or a or some sort of high power magnifying glass that's good. Um, I, I can show you some of the uh, some of the key features that you're going to be looking at when you're dealing with uh, when you're trying to figure out if you have a uh, a, um, a bed bug. Certainly, if you're having a problem determining that it is a bed bug because the person say put it under ten layers of tape and smashed it with a hammer, um, you might have to send it to a specialist. And, and within each of the states, there are insect specialists uh, through the extension program in each state who can uh, who can um, uh, who can identify bed bugs for you um, or not. If you're having problems 
uh, finding a, an expert in your particular area, certainly call the the bedbug hotline at the end of the uh, at the end of the uh, the session, and we we can find out if there's a if there's a place nearby that can do it, or else give you the address of where you can send it. So some uh, key identifying features of bed bugs that we that we typically look at um, are the antenna. Um, we're looking at four um, different segments, and the the basal segments or the segments that are closer to the uh, head are going to be in the head's right here, and here's here's the eyes. Here's another eye right here, um, and near the head we're looking at thicker segments. And then as we go out from the uh, from the head, we're looking at much thinner segments. So those are those are uh, we can't just look at the antenna, but that's the way that's where we start. Uh, next, we look at the pronotum, and that's that that's if we're looking at the head right here, that's that plate behind the head, and that plate is going to be a uh, a particular C shaped uh, behind, right behind the head, and this is pretty diagnostic for 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 bed bugs. Um, you may get that, this, this occurring in some other pests, but, but uh, this is a key area that we look at. And then we also, besides the pronotum and the, and the um, uh, shape, we also look for these lateral hairs hanging off the, uh, hanging off the pronotum at, at, uh, um, laterally from the pronotum. And so we're looking at, uh, we're looking at those two combinations um, as being, a, uh, as being a, um, um, a key to, uh, to bed bug identification. If we're looking at these hairs, uh, in the common bed bug, the hairs are relatively short, as I'm indicating right here. They're shorter than half the diameter of the eye. Whereas if the hairs are longer, um, the longer than half the diameter, so the, the, the length here is going to be longer than half the diameter of the eye right here, then we're looking at um, the common bed bug's uh, hairier um, cousin, that would be the bat bug or the, uh, or the swallow bug. For, for example, and uh, I usually just call them the long-haired uh, wilder crew, uh, wilder crew uh, compared to the uh, compared to the uh, um, compared to the common bed bug. Another identifying feature of uh, of bed bugs are these wing pads. These wing pads are of a particular shape, and um, sometimes I'll use that in addition with the colors and some of the hairs. To, uh, to, to identify a, a bed bug, uh, um, a bed, whether it's a bed bug or not. Sometimes they're just so smashed um, after people get a hold of them under tape that, that it's really tough to try and, um, uh, to try and uh, um, uh, get a clear ID. So I will sometimes look at the shape of those wing pads as well. So that's the summary, making sure that we have identification of, uh, of a proper identification. We know that we're actually dealing with bed bugs. And, and that in many cases can be, um, you know, can make you, a, uh, um, can make you a, a, a friend for life when it, comes to, uh, when it comes to identifying them and telling someone that they, in fact, don't have bed bugs, they have something else. And, uh, and, and they, you know, for instance, a... Uh, uh, Carpet beetle, or, or 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 something else that might be easier to control. Um, you can certainly uh, you can certainly um, uh, make a customer for life by doing that. Okay. So tip number three: bed bugs are specialists in living next to people, um, and this is really important. Uh, they hide, and they spend. Um, uh, research has shown they'll spend the majority of their time hiding. Um, they will come out to feed every once in a while, um, but they're they're I, you know compared to the feeding, compared to the reproduction that we talk about at times, really their specialty is hiding, and their specialty next to hiding is being able to disperse and keep to uh, keep to very low numbers in 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 sites until it's too late and you have a very expensive infestation. So those are two things that you really have to think about and, and consider. A lot of times they will fly under the radar until you, at some point you get someone who gets such, such extensive biting that, that they, that they, and they're, and they're reacting that, uh, that finally we start to get complaints. The issue is, is that if you're just responding to complaints, you might be missing the bigger picture, and quite often you are. And just to give you an idea, if we have a, uh, of, of, of what could happen here and has happened in the past, 
if I look, give you this uh, sort of uh, schematic scenario of the uh, of the um, of of of, a, of an apartment with a, a, a single floor of apartments, um, we're looking at six apartments stacked together, and this middle apartment has has a, has a large infestation of bed bugs, large infestation in the bedroom, as well as bed bugs clustering around the uh, around say where a, a, a sofa or couch would normally be. Um, maybe a couple over in the corner next to a sitting chair, and then lo and behold, there's one next to the uh, to the um, uh, in in the adjacent apartment, possibly having gone through a wall to to get to that. Uh, well, at at some point in time, um, bed bugs are likely to spread, and they could spread into a, a neighboring apartment. They could come out of the uh, come out of the um, uh, come out of the apartment, walk down the hall, and into another apartment. Um, and we've seen uh, um, some research, particularly from China Luan's group at Rutgers, that shows that there's fairly, fairly uh, uh, prodigious um, uh, dispersal, um, not only uh, between walls, but also down the hall. And they found bed bugs in hallways, um, and they are seem to be dispersing at, the, at that point. So, so now back to the, the problem. Say now you get a uh, you get a complaint coming from from someone. Uh, perhaps that complaint is not coming from the source population. Maybe it's coming from the periphery, and it just so happens to be that that uh, that, that that apartment has a um, um, has, has that person is hypersensitive, and that bed bug had happened to feed that single bed bug had happened to feed on that person, and the hypersensitivity of that person caught, generated the complaint. And then we could also have a case where in this other apartment where the complaint occurred. Perhaps it wasn't the bed bug that is next to the door that caused the complaint. Perhaps it was the 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 um, uh, the, the the tenant um, sort of uh, talking with this first tenant who's complaining, and then likewise they're going to complain just to make sure that uh, that we've uh, that they've uh, that their that their apartment's covered. And so and so we get two complaints, and um, and. Uh, um, and this becomes uh, this becomes an issue because certainly we can get rid of the complaint, we can get rid of the uh, we can get rid of the, uh, the, the the sort of quote infestation. But guess what? The source population is still available and active in the uh, in the in the apartment in the central area. Um, the other the other scenario is you might get a complaint tip from that apartment. Finally, someone has stayed in that apartment. That is sensitive to them, and they get a they they uh, they it generates a complaint, or maybe there's just so many bed bugs that one time the resident decides to um, uh, decides to uh, uh, conduct a control uh, uh, or decides to uh, do something about it and complains to the landlord. But then we might have an incomplete control where where someone because bed bugs are called bed uh, because bed bugs are called bed bugs. Um, people think that they're just clustered around the bed, so they go in and they do a control job in the bedroom, get rid of the bed bugs. But guess what? They've left the rest of the uh, infestation to, to seed back in to that place. And I think that's a really common uh, issue, particularly in lower income areas, where we're seeing control um, uh, control uh, efforts concentrating around beds alone and not not going elsewhere. And this is not eradication. This is just sort of tamping down an existing infestation that's going to be around for a long time, and you're guaranteed to have an uns unsatisfied um, uh, customers in time as they continually deal with this, and further as bed bugs continue to spread to other apartments. So in your sales and in your activities, you really need to realize the consequences of dispersal, of this insect that's able to disperse so effectively. Do not just focus on the bedrooms. Do not just focus on the complaint by itself, but, uh, you know, start looking at these areas and trying to get ahead a of where the infestation may have spread to. Um, also, ask yourself, are there other areas in, in multiple family housing uh, where, um, that the families are using other points, like, for instance, um, laundry rooms in common areas. Um, ask about visitors to homes that, where chronic infestations have occurred. Um, is it possible that um, the infestation is originating from these visitors' homes 
and that's often been something that's been identified in, in particularly in lower income areas. Um, check neighboring living spaces as well, um, and especially across the hallways, um, below and above. And uh, like I've mentioned, we've had a number of uh, a number of instances where where uh, uh, landlords or or the uh, the service personnel have found those other infestations. And it might be that someone has not been reacted to the uh, bed bugs in that other room. It might be that they're afraid to to bring it forward because they know that there there might be targeted for for um, uh, for um, eviction or something, and, and they might have to pay for it because they might be blamed for it. And so, uh, and so that's a really critical uh, critical point. And when you start talking about your contracts, when you start talking about um, in, uh, influencing a, uh, a landlord to, uh, to to go with your services, talk about getting around that infestation and, and, and doing that eradication step, as well as doing the prevention step as well as part of the program. Realize that connections make the difference. Um, you have a uh, um, you there's the bed bugs will readily connect between areas and and like I've shown you with that schematic of the apartments, uh, there's a number of ways that bed bugs can move um, around in between apartments. And so you really have to make sure that that when you're looking at an infestation, you're just not looking at those four walls, thinking that those four walls right now are going to contain bed bugs, but they're likely to spread. Um, as well, look at the connections of people as they move. A uh, number of times in the past I've shown that that, uh, the, that uh, picture of, uh, of bed bugs on the backpack that's been carried around, uh, but I, it has to be it has to be um, really clearly stated that people are around uh, in their home and they're not, but they're not stuck in their home permanently. They're moving to things like coffee shops and workplaces. They're moving to schools. They're moving to restaurants and retail stores. They're having visitors. They're, they may be picking up recycled furniture depending on their socioeconomic um, um, level. Um, they may be going to libraries. So, so, uh, so think about the system and think about how they're uh, how they're moving. And then it's not just a simple one person or one family moving between all of these things back and forth, back and forth. But it then becomes a community web of of people moving. And it just might not be the uh, um, within that building, but it might be connected with other buildings and with other areas. And so, so this is the actually the web that we're dealing with when we're dealing with bed bugs in terms of people movement and bed bug movement and the connections and how they get into areas. So if we can start eliminating these uh, these uh, these sources uh, progressively, we can start to minimize or marginalize the the infestation. Uh, uh, alternately, if we just continue with the complaint by complaint basis. Then these these uh, these pathways are going to remain, and they're going to continue to uh, freely move around and uh, and and very effectively do a job. So uh, some of the some of the ideas that you should think about when you're dealing with uh, eradication steps, and you're continually having to deal with control uh, issues, are uh, repeat callbacks. Or if you seem to be getting into an area where where uh, just for some reason bed bugs continually to continue to uh, to propagate in that particular living space, um, think about items traveling with the tenant. Um, some of the things that we've uh, we've talked about before and we've experienced um, things like backpacks and computer uh, computer bag, uh, medical devices. Uh, now these are not common ones. But I'll tell you, they're ones that often will will appear, and it's and it might be that one person in the building who's who's continually complaining about it. But they might put on a walking cast when they when they leave the building, um, and they're carrying bed bugs in that walking cast. Um, they might have prosthetics, and we've had at least one case where where bed bugs um, were sitting happily in the socket of a prosthetic. Um, uh, um, and uh, and happily just living there, and and um, and the person was carrying them around unknown. Um, wheelchairs and scooters as well can carry bed bugs and can reseed the apartment. So that's something to think about. Um, books and and toys we uh, we from libraries. Uh, 
a lot of uh, social service um, uh, uh, places uh, or, or people that heavily rely on social services might rely on toys from toy lending libraries or books from a particular um, uh, library. And so we may end up getting infestations in those areas. And even something as simple as a musical instrument case, for instance, you're doing a heating job in an apartment and, uh, and, uh, and you have to remove a, an instrument that was going to be damaged because of heat, um, maybe perhaps that case is carrying bed bugs unknown. Um, now, all of these things that I've mentioned in these uh, have sort of one thing that's in real common, and, and some of the research that we've done has indicated this, that um, when humans place sweat onto items, Bed bugs can identify though that 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 those uh, the soiled items or the the items that have the uh, skin contact and skin odors, and they can associate with them better than than the uh, than uh, than um, say materials that do not receive that treatment, and and not only do they do they are they uh, do they stop nearby those areas, but then they're also attracted from distances to those areas, and so. And so we really have to be cognizant that uh, that these materials ha all have odors that can easily um, indicate to a bed bug that hey, this is a good place to be. And if I stay around this area, uh, there's a good chance that um, that, uh, that a human's going to come by, and I can I can catch a ride. So so think about those those uh, those things. And we've seen even even in um, in cases where people have uh, you've done a, uh, they've done a chemical treatment, but they but they've not had um, the uh, the uh, materials that needed to be dry cleaned um, uh, six, uh, successfully addressed, um, and we get uh, we get uh, bed bugs harboring in the armpits of, of suit coats. So we really have to keep in mind that these that you know there can be other connections and just have to be cognizant. Some other things that have uh, have come up that are very that are very interesting and unfortunately have caused issues. Um, side businesses where people have brought in a lot of shoe boxes or pictures um, or other items that are being sold, um, and uh, and they're bringing things into their apartment and then they're turning around and reselling them. We had one case where where someone was storing stuff down in a. Uh, um, down in a uh, um, in a storage locker in a multifamily housing, and uh, bed bugs moved from an infested area into a uh, into some shoe boxes, and then those shoe boxes were distributed within the community um, through through the sort of side business sales. So, so just in, again, these connections and and they can be. I I think really the sky's the limit. And, uh, you know, when you think that you've seen everything, um, guess what? There's always one more way that bed bugs can, uh, can, uh, can surprise you. For tip number three, always expect that they will be ahead of your control activities. Um, until you begin to see real reductions and until you start selling this expectation that you need to do that eradication and prevention step, and then you need to come back and, uh, and, and keep an eye on things and see when, when problems are occurring and what sort of special uh, uh, issues you may end up, uh, you may end up um, uh, dealing with. On to tip number four. Generally, people are very uninformed of bed bugs. And in particular, um, they often do not want to know about bed bugs uh, unless they happen to get them. And um, and uh, there's been several times when when you know I think it's normal to be interested in bed bugs. I'm fascinated by bed bugs, but when I start to talk to people, even my coworkers about bed bugs, uh, quite often they look at me kind of weird. Um, and so that's just something I have to deal with, I guess, in time. And Amelia's giving me. Amelia is nodding her head very vigorously right now. So, so we have uh, um, we have uh, uh, an issue of, of people not wanting to be informed about bed bugs, and unless they unless they get them, and uh, other than that, they do not want to be known. Now, teaching people about bed bugs who don't want to know about bed bugs can be a problem and can really com com complicate the selling and the um, and the contract. Uh, perspectives or the, or the activities that you're going to do. 
If you spend, suddenly start quoting that, that, that bed bugs have aggregation pheromones, that they collect in areas, that they, that they communicate chemically, um, and that they, that they will spread like wildfire and that they, that they can live for up to a year or so, um, then people are going to quickly phase out. So I think what's important is that the teaching about bed bugs has to be done through your actions. So, so yes, bed bugs aggravate. So what are, what are you as the pest management professional going to do about it? Yes, bed bugs have this chemical communication. Yes, they disperse. What are you going to do about it in your services? What are you going to illustrate in your contract that shows that you're going to address that? And I think then when the landlord comes back and says, well, why is it costing me this much? You can point to it and say, well, we have to get ahead of the infestation because they aggregate in areas where, where people are going to be generally unaware of them and they're likely to disperse very rapidly. And so that's what, that's the teaching moment right there. But what you've done instead of just coming forward immediately and saying, well, you know, they disperse, they, they do all this thing, they have this wonderful, these wonderful characteristics that allow them to survive. Rather than get into that, Put it into put it into actions in your contract. What are you going to do about it to uh, to prevent uh, to prevent them from uh, first of all to eradicate them and then to prevent them from reoccurring again? You know, again, I, I show this type of picture, and, and uh, often the question uh, after uh, after the after the reply of I didn't know that they were that big. Um, they'll often ask me, well, and why do you do this? And they 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 really don't want to know about bed bugs. They really do not want to uh, want the excruciating detail. And we can even see this when uh, when we start looking at our, um, um, our 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 data from phone calls and emails and web web page views. Um, you know, when we get people that come to the sites or, or call us, they're typically trying to deal with bed bugs, or they're trying to uh, they're trying to understand some some types of of, of bed bug uh, bed bug issue. Um, but a lot of times, it's 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 less of the well, you know, what's the what's the characteristics of bed bugs? Why are they so successful? It's more the how do I get rid of them on my own, or how do I, or, or you know, what do I do to to control bed bugs? It's a lot of do-it-yourself types of types of activities. Um, in the web page views, you know, the top pages by far are you know laundering items. How do I launder items for bed bugs? How do I freeze the to kill bed bugs? And so there's 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 a there's really a and, and there are other sites. There are our, there was our site as well that had this. You know this excruciating detail, and and we're not seeing this 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 desire to learn about them. We're seeing this desire to I got to get rid of them, and so we have to make sure that uh, that we that we um, that we address these items appropriately when the time is needed for them to do that, and uh, and really make sure that they're that what their responsibility is 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 apportioned within the contract. Um, and so we're not sort of teaching them the generalities, but we're really instructing them specifically on what they need to do. Um, uh, but another thing that was in our this result, res, uh, uh, this, the, these reports that was really quite shocking and, and a little bit disturbing was the idea that um, the pest control um, activities or people searching for pest control, at least that were coming to our phone phone calls and emails or coming to the, uh, the, 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 the information line or coming to the web page, we're not looking for professional pest control. That was hugely second to, uh, to what can I do about it myself. And so we're looking at, you know, at, it, we're out of phone calls and emails, hiring a pest control service questions was, was 20th on our list. Um, less than 0.6% of all calls and emails dealt with, well, how do I hire a pest control company? Um, on the website, again, we're looking at 33rd in a list of a long list of, of, of page views that were done, and so we're looking at less. We're looking at about 0.5 percent of, of people looking for specific information on hiring a pest control service. So this this brings up a couple of things. First of all, um, if it's not first and foremost on the list, it might be that the that that they're that they're trying to do it themselves because they are not understanding the value. That you're bringing to the to the table and, and getting rid of it, 
or it might be a factor that that they just don't have the money, um, or their landlord is is uh, is not being cooperative, and they're just desperate to try something themselves. It also brings up the point that yes, you are going to have people who are going to try things themselves before they uh, before they call you in. So uh, so just keep that in mind when as as the infestation grows and spreads because of uh, because of inappropriate control methods. Also on our web um, on our information line. Also on our information line, we uh, we get uh, we get issues of uh, you know well, well when they do finally look for a pest control service, what are they looking for? And they're really looking for reassurance that their efforts, as well as you. Doors as the pest control is going to be successful. They're looking for reputable service, and they're looking for easy to understand information on what's involved with the treatments, both what are you going to do as well as what are they, what are their responsibilities. So simplifying it, burying that science in your contract and what you're going to do is really key to making sure that everyone understands the, the expectations and that you're going to get success if you use, if you follow these steps. We find issues with um, uh, con continuously with uh, uh, usable and, and proper instructions that are that are uh, that are being um, handed out. Often um, the instructions are are in English. Um, they're tougher. They can be uh, sort of a higher level because someone's cut and pasted from from other sources. Um, they're not simplified. Uh, see what you can do about creating like a pictogram instructions. Um, and this is particularly important if you have limited English ability or, or lingua, limited English or limited reading ability in certain populations. Now, you know, you're not necessarily challenged by yourself. Um, there are some resources out there to, to help with this. Um, you know, we have videos in other languages and, there, and, uh, and handouts in other languages that can be used, and certainly a number of other extension groups around the country have provided this type of uh, this type of resources as well. But if you really are desperate, find out if there are social services or other organizations that can help out with this type of thing. And just to let you know, um, these are some of the people we, at the very least, have contacted. Um, in some cases, we work more closely with other than other others. But these are some of an example of some of the um, of some of the social service. Uh, groups that are around, it could potentially be available to to help you in just the small three uh, communities that uh, that that that, uh, that we we have here in Minnesota, um, and that's probably three of perhaps 126 different languages that uh, that are that are uh, spoken within the Twin Cities alone. So other things that you might want to consider: uh, please try avoiding uh, scare tactics. Uh, particularly uh, because a lot of people are going to be uncertain and have anxiety. Um, we we found that there was a, a heat versus insecticides uh, a debate going on at the customer level. Um, people that were doing insecticide using insecticides were saying don't use heat because they cause damage. People who were doing heat were saying don't use insecticides because they're dangerous and you got sprayed all over the place. And this is really causing confusion. They both work in their own right. They both have advantages and disadvantages. So please try and avoid the uh, the, the scare tactic type of uh, type of approaches. Um, please try and avoid discarding furniture, especially in low income areas. If you if they discard furniture, they have to find new furniture. Where are they going to get it? Is it going to be infested? Um, it's best if we can try, unless it's really. Uh, really, you know, not worth anything and needs to be properly disposed of, um, you know, and if you do have to do that, see what you can do about creating sources of people to, uh, to, uh, um, uh, or sources of organizations who could help you to replace that, uh, that, that furniture or, or point the tenants in the direction. Um, we're reporting non-compliance. Of course, we you have to do that uh, to make sure that the uh, that the landlords know that when you've got an area that's that's uh, that's not um, uh, that that has not been properly prepared. And I give you this example: if you walk into a place like this and you 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 give them heads up that for you know 24 to 48 hours um, as required in certain locations. 
to, to, to clean it up and get it ready for treatment, and it's not done. This is clearly noncompliance. But we've also, on the same coin, we've had some places, uh, some pest control companies have been forced by their landlords to, uh, to, to instruct the, the tenants to move everything into the hallway. Um, and yet when one thing is left in that room, um, to be, to, for instance, a picture hanging on the wall, we've had pest control co- companies of technicians say, uh, sorry, I can't do that, um, uh, uh, I can't do the control, because, uh, and I have to report this as a noncompliance. And sometimes landlords are using this method to recoup their costs. And, and so this is something that you have to, uh, that you have to, you have to think about. Do we necessarily want to be doing that because it, because it becomes a, uh, because it becomes a major issue? And it becomes a legal issue that then becomes argumentative. And guess what? You get caught in the middle of that. So, um, when you're, when you're, when you're working and your sales information and your contracts, make sure you're protecting yourself as well as when you're full thoroughly communicating. Uh, make sure you review those materials on a regular basis. Make sure that they are accurately reflecting what your control practices actually are. And that's uh, that's just a quick note on that. Um, so your this, your um, uh, in summary, you know, make sure that you are you are providing them information through what you plan to do and how you intend to communicate. And make sure that um, that you you know you save all the abundance of facts until you really need to reinforce your expertise. I think that's the critical thing with num- with tip number four. And so that's really that's really critical. To summarize with that, um, uh, you know we have the tools, but usually there are other issues with the with the delivery. And, um, uh, you know, and I'll just summarize these as, you know, making sure that you eradicate and prevent uh, um, bed bugs in, in, uh, in areas and use the pest management program to plan your um, eradication and prevention events. Make sure you properly identify um, the, the, the pests that you're dealing with. Make sure that, that, uh, that, or make sure you realize that bed bugs are specialists but they are predictable in their behavior, and they do have weaknesses you can take advantage of. You just need to communicate that with landlords and with your customer. Um, avoid too much information. Let your, act, your actions speak volumes. Um, this is really critical when you're, uh, when you're, when you're dealing with that. And, uh, and then be aware that your, your communication is, uh, is uh, when your communication is not enough. And I will leave that uh, at there um, and uh, take any questions. So we we have a chat box. If you look up in the upper right hand corner, it says chat. If you hit on that box in your on your uh, on your screen, um, you can you can open up a chat window and then you can type the questions. Uh, we figured this would probably be the easiest uh, since we have so many people on online. We do have a question to ask: How well do the products that say they have an X day residual actually work for those number of days? Okay, so we have um, we have residuals that have claims, and uh, those claims are backed up by research. Um, they often have the um, they often have actual tests that uh, where they put bed bugs on X number of days um, after aging the, uh, the residues, and we do get quite effective control of the uh, on on those residues. The trick, though. Is that we have to rely, make sure that those bed bugs will come in contact with the residues, and they come in contact with the residues long enough to uh, uh, to to kill them, and so that that then becomes the challenge. Um, and when we're using re- uh, residues, if we're not using them to the fullest extent that the label will allow, then we end up with with gaps in areas where bed bugs might quickly run across. Um, an area that has an insecticide application, but might not pick up enough insecticide. Have you found that Devlin is an effective solution? Okay. Um, generally, um, all of the commercial products that are available for use um, and used according to their label have um, have efficacy against bed bugs. 
Now, the the uh, the Benlam, of course, and, and some of the other products that are using a pyrethrin type of base might have uh, some difficulties from a residual standpoint because we have bed bugs that are resistant to that base type of chemical, and um, and the and and so and so any sort of reduced uptake is is going to be detoxified by the bed bug. However, in general, and, and I've worked in I've worked in um, areas in Canada where the majority of the materials have been pyrethrins or permethrin, and even with resistant um, bed bugs, we can still gain control with the uh, with those types of chemistries. It just has to be a thorough application. What is a good role for using diatomaceous earth? What is its efficacy, and can it be considered for eradication use? Okay, yeah, um, diatomaceous earth. Um, from other researchers, they have found that it is a little bit slower than uh, than other materials available. Um, but it is it has its advantages um, in that it is very long lived as long as it doesn't get wet or high humidity and start clumping together. And so um, I generally, you know, according to the labels, uh, and again, follow the labels when you're using that stuff. But but personally, um, you know, looking at it in Areas where uh, the people are not going to come into contact with it in behind in hidden areas, um, a lot of the dusts are highly visible. So putting it into areas that are going to uh, where cryptic bed bugs could be um, in behind uh, in wall voids or in underneath baseboards, um, that type of thing, I think, is where it has its it has its greatest impact. Um, but again, as a standalone item. Uh, it's it's one tool in the toolbox that we have to use uh, for, uh, uh, for for dealing with this insect. Can you briefly explain the heat method of eradication, and is that alone effective? Okay, the heat method of eradication. So um, there's a number of ways that heat can be used. You can either use it in a chamber type of uh, situation where you heat the you heat a um, a chamber, say a trailer or a uh, shipping container. Or, or some companies have these tents um, where you put the material, you put the materials to be heated within that uh, that that environment, and then you turn a heater on. Um, the other way is whole room heating, where you're actually bringing in heaters into the uh, into the room, you're setting them up, and you're delivering heat into that room. Now uh, the temperatures you have to you have to achieve high temperatures to ensure a kill. And so uh, typically heat is going to be delivered in, in the air around 135, 140 Fahrenheit. Uh, the target temperature that you want to hit with the, uh, with where the bed bugs are is going to be about 122 degrees Fahrenheit or so, 120, 122 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere in there. That temperature um, will kill all stages, including the eggs. Um, if you're below that temperature, there's a time difference. And if you go onto our website, you can see what that time uh, that time uh, difference is. Um, the one caution that is that there's a number of things that can be um, can be damaged by that heat at that time, and you have to sort of look, go through the area and look um, and see what sort of risky materials might be there that could uh, that could uh, that could might be damaged by this. Some a short list would be like long playing the LP records, the vinyl records. Um, you know, you may, if you get overheating, you may get DVDs uh, damaged um, or uh, instruments, medi or instruments, medical, pharmaceuticals, that sort of thing, um, compressed gas cylinders, that sort of thing. You have to, and aerosol cans. So you have to think about uh, and ask questions. And often people who are selling the, uh, the, the equipment will have training programs to tell you what you should look out for and how to minimize your, uh, your, um, your, the, the damage that might occur. But generally, it is effective. One of the advantages it has is that you don't have to have the the, um, the customer go through and do all their cleaning and, and and packing up, bagging, and laundering all their stuff. Most of the stuff can be left out, and so the heating is you have more control in that area of the for the uh, for the for the site. So, are ozone gas or alcohol effective for treating bugs? Uh, no. Um, the ozone required is is very high. In fact, um, well above the um, levels immediately dangerous to life or health for humans. Um, and so there's some uh, there's some issue there. Um, and uh, and even then, um, there's some limited penetration into eggs 
that will uh, that will uh, um, essentially uh, essentially negate I think that technology. Um, the other the other uh, um, uh, sorry what was the other uh, alcohol? Okay, yeah, alcohol is is a uh, is a is we 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 uh, strongly um, uh, recommend against using alcohol. Uh, there is a product on the market that has alcohol in it, uh, but you can use that according to label. Um, but the other materials that typically where we get fires and the majority of fires have occurred has been, have been someone using alcohol um, and, uh, and either smoking or leaving an open flame and uh, the fumes building up enough that it, that it causes a flashover. So um, we, uh, you, we need to stay away from anything that is not registered for use with uh, against bed bugs, um, and that certainly includes rubbing alcohol and other similar. Is bezel effective sprayed directly on eggs? Okay, bedlam on eggs. Um, that I'm not too sure about, and that would probably be best answered by the uh, either the supplier of the material or the uh, or the um, um, uh, or the manufacturer. Um, what about steam heat? Yeah, steam is very effective, and early on in the um, um, in the uh, when when I dealt with the, the this insect in uh, 2001 through 2004, um, myself and actually there were some other companies independently who who uh, who looked at steam uh, treatment equipment um, for for use uh, against bed bugs. And it is very effective as a surface uh, uh, surface control or contact control. It kind of reduces your need for the sort of short-acting insecticides that you might use in other areas. Um, the key thing is is that you have to hit critical temperatures with uh, with the steam. Um, and um, in another talk that I give, I, I talk about using a non-contact thermometer, and you have to have that temperature up near about 160 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, immediately after the steam wand has left that surface. So as you're moving this, the, the wand along, you want to be checking that temperature on a regular basis to make sure you're not going too fast that you're getting cooling or not too slow that you're causing overheating. Um, it does take a bit of finesse, um, and it does take a bit of practice with the different attachments. You do not want to use a, uh, a single jet steamer because if you do, you're likely to bowl bed bugs across the room, and then they're going to get away. They're going to get up and walk away. So, so there's some finessing that has to be done with uh, with heat treatments or with uh, with steam treatments, as well. Once you're finished with the steam treatment, there's a moisture management situation. You have to dry down the area again, um, leaving it wet for too long causes molding and mildew uh, smells to to occur. And so it's it's not too bad, uh, but you just have to be aware of it. But overall, it is an effective uh, method, um, and I've, I've trained people to use steam in the past, and uh, it is another alternative that can be used. But again, it's that sort of that short-term, immediate contact type of uh, type of thing. It's not going to get anything. It's going to be deeper than within a within a crack between wood. It's not going to go deeper than about a, a half an inch, and within fabric itself, it's not going to go any deeper than about a, a quarter inch. So. We have another question, and I think what they're trying to ask is, why do you use the term eradication and prevention and not continue the management? Okay. Um, what we want to do, and, and that's a very good question because, you know, we get into sort of the semantics about, well, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to manage a population? Or are you trying to control a population? And, and then um, what I'm trying to do with this type of, uh, this, this type of wording is, is, is say we have a, we have a parasite in a in a nest area or in a, in a room or in a living space, and and all of those individuals have to be removed. They have to be eradicated, and so we want to use steps that that have that goal of eradication. And then the management situation comes up when we step back and we look at how we take that eradication prevention combination to the rest of the building. Now, typically when we start talking about pest management, we're talking about other things. And when you go onto websites that talk about pest management, they start talking about things like thresholds and, and, uh, and monitoring and, and a whole bunch of other steps. But they're never put into sort of a concert of things that need to be done. And so, and so by providing those active sort of, those active sort of ideas, you eradicate and you prevent. It provides you with some key terms that, that, 
pest management professionals can use with their customers that shows a direct uh, end goal for that particular infestation. And then the management comes in, the management part comes into, well, how do you manage those steps as you go through the building successively getting rid of bed bugs? My role as a canine inspection sometimes leaves me as a liaison between customer and pest company disputes. Ideas to keep everybody towards the goal of extermination and mitigation. Yeah, and I assume that's not a question but a statement, but I, but I agree with that. Um, that you know sometimes canines can be can be effective and uh, and using canines to uh, to to back up um, success really helps. So I think he's asking about any so. ideas that we might have to keep both the customer and the pest control company moving towards the goal of extermination. And Oh, okay. All right. Well, I think what, you know, you start thinking that way, um, and it, it starts to, it starts to, I, I start to get the idea that, that perhaps the, you know, the, the, either the control program is not, is not, um, is not extensive enough, or there's been things that have been left out of the, left out of the equation. And when I say things that have been left out, that is, those are those connections. And then it becomes, if it's uh, if it's the if it's the the responsibility of the pest management company or if it's the responsibility of the of the of the um, of the of the person living in that space, and so I think you know the person who does the canine in between those two has sort of a job to you know be diplomatic in making sure that yeah the the uh, the, the the tenant or the the person responsible for that building. Is, is doing is making sure that things are doing appropriately, and then at the same time talking to the pest management professional, asking them, are they have they done enough? Are they do they need to do more? Have they communicated this? Is there something missing with the uh, with how it, the uh, the pest management services were delivered? And it, and it could be the fact that hey, bed bugs just happen to get into an area that you know it's um, quite often I find that that customers. Are often pointing their fingers when they, when bed bugs are existing. Customers will often point their fingers automatically to the pest control service when, in fact, they should be pointing their fingers at the bed bug issue and and the bed bugs themselves and how they might be actually creating a special circumstance that hasn't been previously encountered. The next question is: When treating for bed bugs, is there shoe or pant material that is more resistant to bed bugs climbing? Also, they also ask. What are your thoughts on using 99% alcohol as a deterrent from bed bugs crawling on your shoe? Okay, for the alcohol to climb on your shoes, no, don't use it. Um, it's, it's, uh, um, I actually would find that if you were to take, a, you know, a standard wet wipe, um, so, or a damp, or, or a slightly damp cloth, and use it around shoes, um, use it on shoes, uh, that, to mechanically remove the bed bugs, that's probably going to be more effective than than, than alcohol will be. Um, and you and you know you just have to make sure that the shoes will be able to take that type of thing. And if you if you're afraid of that, then um, um, then then don't then don't use that. Um, and then sorry, the other the other part of that. A material there. Is there other power stick on it? No, there's not there's not really any repellent that 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 could be that could be used as effective. Um, bed bugs actually have a uh, have a have a method of climbing up um, over repellents if it's on a vertical surface. Okay. And then there's a follow-up question to the canine question. And the individual asks, "Is it a conflict of interest for a pest company to also provide the service of their own dog?" Um, I personally, I don't think it is a conflict of interest. I think that the people that dogs are very expensive. And and so they will want to make sure that it's that it that it's uh, that it's being done properly. And I know a lot of the companies that have that have purchased dogs are generally reputable in their in their in their activities. And so and so I have not seen any place where a conflict of interest has has, has arisen um, that would sort of justify a uh, um, justify a control job or or, or uh, you know or a fake control job or anything like that. Um, you know, it does. It does, in some cases, provide a uh, provide a perhaps a um, uh, a marketing um, uh, a marketing advantage from one company over another. But I don't really don't think it's a conflict of interest. 
And one final question. How is the cryonic freezing working for control? Oh, the cryonite freezing? Okay. Yeah, the cryonite freezing, um, I, I, I really, um, I have not had a lot of experience with that. Uh, because in, in Minnesota, I don't think it was, it was adopted, um, very, very widespread. So I don't really have, uh, much, um, a, a much exposure to that. From a, from a, uh, uh, from a, the conceptual level, what that, what the Trinite system does is eject, um, dry ice, which is frozen, which is, uh, which is solid carbon dioxide. And by ejecting the dry ice in a fine, in a fine mist or spray, um, it, it, uh, um, the dry ice is at minus 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And so anywhere where it's going to contact the bed bug, um, it's going to cause chill damage. And if there's enough, um, if there's enough of the, uh, the dry ice that hits the bed bug, it'll, it'll kill the bed bug. Um, the bed bugs will, uh, the lowest point that they can, that they can withstand, uh, for immediate kill, is going to be somewhere around about minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit, and so and so the um, and so by uh, and so by hitting them at minus 72 degrees Fahrenheit, it, you have an, a potentially an effective method of, of quickly rapidly freezing uh, bed bugs. But it, again, it's one of those things. Just like heat, it's it, or steam. Once it past the area. That area can be prone to reinfestation, so you have to be you have to use it as a part of an integrated program. No more questions. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, for attending. I believe we have a. Uh, um, are you going to put the the it'll automatically? Okay, after we sign off here, um, there will be a questionnaire that comes up, and we would really appreciate uh, hearing from you and getting some feedback and what you what you think about this. Uh, we have two more um, uh, webinars that will be that will be scheduled. One will be on uh, will be specific to social service uh, 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 people, and then the other uh, the other one will be specific to landlords. Um, we are going to provide some of the similar information to to landlords and make sure that they start to in, uh, in, um, increase their expectations of what should be done with uh, with controls. So I thank you very much. After we sign off here, you will, uh, there'll be a questionnaire. Please fill it out. We would really appreciate your, your feedback. Thank you very much and have a good day.